and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and say, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a young man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to feel, fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. May God add his blessing to the reading of these stories here this morning. You may be seated. For the next few weeks, other than the first Sunday of the month of communion, we're going to look at parables. But I want to look at parables differently than maybe you have heard them. I, I don't know. I grew up hearing parables um, in allegory. And so what I wanted to look at is how do I make these parables different than what you all have already heard? You've heard these stories. You know what it, they're about. So we're going to look at them non-allegorically. We're going to look at what they say and then discover what the teaching really was meant to the first century listeners. Again, we've added a lot of things to decide what the people were in these stories. We know that the themes were loss, joy, feasting. We still saw that in what was read here today. So the first two end in, a, in a feasting and celebration, but the third one ends with the father interacting with the eldest son. And, and by the time that happens, we don't even know which son is lost. And so we're going to look at these stories that Jesus is telling because he knows everyone he is speaking to have been lost. And so he has these stories for them. And they're three separate stories distinct. You can preach them individually. You can also preach them in a group with what we're doing here today. So what is allegory? What is allegory? It's a, it's a story to reveal some hidden meaning. And we know that parables do not have to be a story that actually happens. It may just be a story. It could be something that happened, but it doesn't have to be. But we're going to look at these stories again. We're not going to decide what the coin represents or what the sheep represents. We're going to look at it as a coin and as a sheep. 
And we're going to see what the meaning is in that. And so we know that as we find the lost, and as there is rejoicing that happens, you see that in the story, we know that finding and rejoicing is how we show God's attitude. And when we show God's attitude, then we are one in moral harmony with God. So we're going to look at these stories, and we're going to look at them and see just how they were heard by first century listeners. Because first century listeners did not look at them allegorically. And so we know that the stories, when we have had them preached to us, they're, they're really good stories. So we're going to look and see what this sheep owner that had a hundred sheep, what this is all about. And so we know that we tend to say that the sheep owner is a shepherd. We even will say sometimes the shepherd lost a sheep. But what the interesting thing is, now Jesus can use the word shepherd whenever he wants, however he wants. But if you listen to what was read today, it never uses the word shepherd. We assume, we even say, the shepherd lost the sheep. But nowhere in the story does it say that it was a shepherd. We do know it was an owner of sheep. And if the owner of sheep had a hundred sheep, he probably was a fairly wealthy guy. And we also know that shepherds were not wealthy people. So we're going to look at this sheep owner as a sheep owner. And that's how we're going to look at all of these parables. And I'll just confess to you, this is one of the things I love about the Bible. I love to get into why Jesus said what he said the way he said it. And I know I do it as a novice. But I love being a novice at it. And so if you'll just try to bear with me here as I go through this great lesson for me. Because I love the way these parables turn out. And so we're going to look at the one, the first one, the lost sheep. Uh, most people believe that the lost sheep is a believer that is lost. And the sheep owner that is going to... To, fit, to seek him would be what Jesus, who wants to seek the sheep. And, and that's fine, that preaches really well, but we're not going to look at it that way, because when we look at the story that way, for me, it loses a bit of the genius of Jesus' teaching. And we know that Jesus was the master teacher. And he was a genius at teaching. And so as he was sitting on the hillside or in a group of people, he was telling them these stories, and again, they were not looking at them except for what they were. But Luke really introduces this allegory to us because he says, right in the first one, in verse 7, 15, 7, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous people who did not need to repent. But what we've got to find out is, how does a sheep repent? We don't even know that the sheep sin. But we assume that the sheep sinned and then repented. That's how we use that word. But we're not going to live. It's a sheep that got lost. How did the sheep owner know the sheep was lost? He had a hundred. Their numbers weren't on their back. He didn't have them getting groups. One through ten, eleven through nineteen. He didn't do that. So how did he know that the sheep was lost? He counted them. And when he counted them, he only had 99. He knew that one of them had wandered off. But it doesn't say that he saw it because the sheep had sinned. And he was going to go get them so he could repent. No. He wanted to go and find the sheep that was lost out of his hunting. And then we find out, we look, we, we see that the sheep is found by the sheep owner, and now the sheep is on the shoulders of the sheep owner, walking back to the other 99. Both of them are in an uncomfortable, position, uncomfortable position. The sheep owner doesn't want to be carrying the sheep on his shoulder, and the sheep would rather be <coughs> bleeding with the other 99. But that's what he does. And so we don't think that the shepherd, at least doesn't say it was, it went found him. We don't have any repentance. We don't have any sin. 
Maybe the fault lies with the sheep owner. He's the one that lost the sheep. Because he's the overseer of the hundred. And when he counted, he only had ninety-nine. But then he finds it. And there's a party. So why would he be so excited when he finds the sheep? Well, because that would be worth something. But why would the neighbors care? You found your sheep. Great. Why'd you lose them? But it says that they had a party and there was rejoicing. So why would the sheep owner want to celebrate the finding of one sheep? Why would his friends? So we see there's, there's a challenge in this parable, a, a new challenge for us to wonder why Jesus is telling it that way. One is missing out of the hundred. He counts it. He knows that it's missing. And then he experiences joy when he finds it. That's the story. So what does it mean to us? The Pharisees would have looked for the lost sheep and understood that the owner is supposed to look rigorously for the lost sheep. When he finds it, he's to bring it back. But also, the Pharisees probably wouldn't have celebrated. Jesus tells them that they celebrate. The Pharisees would say, there's no reason to celebrate that because you found it on your own. Jesus is teaching them that when a believer finds the lost, it's because God is involved in the finding. And maybe our lesson in this is we are to make every effort to find what or whom we have lost. Pharisees would have searched, but they wouldn't have attributed any of the findings to God. know that Jesus rejoices when he finds lost things because he loves to find the lost. And maybe that's our lesson in this parable, is that we, when we are lost, are separated from God. The sheep is separated from the flock. And so keeping with the heart of God, we know that Jesus taught us to love, and we are to love the lost. And maybe we're to count among us to see if all are present or are we missing one. And then we should do all we can to find the lost. And when we find them, we're to do what? Throw a party. Tell our friends. Have a celebration. That's if we're looking at it non allegorical how about the parable of the lost coin? Now the challenge in this, in the first century, would have been what? It's about a woman who has ten coins. That was a big challenge for them in the day. Because a lot of times you would see women as what? No status or low status. But here Jesus is telling the story of a woman who has some coins. Now, we know that the Old Testament has what? Esther and Ruth. If you're a reader of the Apocrypha, you know the book of Judith is a great heroine in that book. <coughs> it's not been canonized, but you can read it. It's a great story. You can learn a story about a woman in the book of Judith. But even though the sheep owner would not have been offensive or unattractive, this one is about a woman. But what the sheep and the woman and the sheep owner have in common is they are completely unremarkable. Like my daughter likes to describe me as perfectly average. <laughs> That's who they were. So we have this Jewish woman now who has funds. Coins. And so she has these, and we read, though, in Luke, Luke 8 says, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others, these women were helping to support Jesus' group out of their own means. What? So women actually supported Jesus' ministry with their own money. So maybe we have been given women of the first century an unfair look. That there were women that actually had money. And this isn't to create a negative vision of Judaism, but 
Maybe there's a surprise or something that broke here. Maybe something else is going on here if there's a story about a woman who has knowledge. But what happens? She's missing a coin. How does she know that she's missing a coin? But she counts it. And she only has nine. So she's missing a coin. And the coin had some value. It was probably part of her dowry, something that was given to her for, by her forebearers. And like the sheep owner who was missing one sheep, sheep the woman counts and is missing, and she has to find it. Now, we could say if she had ten coins, she had some wealth. But scholars believe that this was a Syrian woman who lived in, in low means, had a, an adobe house, no windows, um, reeds on the floor, so now the coin is lost, and she has dim lit lighted lamps to look for this, and she searches how? Everywhere. Under beds, boxes, anywhere she sweeps the floor. She's looking for the coin. And what does she do when she finds it? She celebrates. The coin that I had lost. But she does something different than the she, she takes responsibility for losing the coin. The coin that I lost, I have found. Do we celebrate finding what we lose? Do we take responsibility for losing it? She does. And so she throws a party. And we know that in the Greek, the nouns that are used for the party invitations and all the language in Greek is all in the feminine. So she is inviting women to the party to entertain. And then Luke 15, 10 says, what? In the same way I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of angels, well, of God over one sinner who repents. Again, Luke is trying to tell us in allegory what it means. But in this interpretation that we read, Neither the sheep nor the coin did anything of note. Luke here is assuming that they demonstrate where sinners have a change of heart. But it's hard to understand that because there's no sheep shame. There's no coin penitence. <laughs> so can we really read that into it? The sheep and the coin did not sin. They didn't repent. Even deeper, the sheep owner and the woman did not forgive. So what's going on? We know what the allegory is. We talked about it. We know what that is. But what did God intend with the lost sheep, the lost coin, and a man with two sons? They're in that group. We can read them individually. We can read them together. I think God probably wants us to understand that there are times when, when we can be covered up with rust or filth from sin, and that we're recoverable. But when we're lost, we're not in the state God intended. We can say the woman is like the Holy Spirit, makes diligent, thorough, and unceasing search for the coin or the soul. Say that in the houses of God's humanity. But Jesus would understand that all believers are to join in the recovery efforts of lost souls. That's what he taught. That we're all to recover. We're all supposed to count. We're all supposed to search diligently and thoroughly for the lost. We should turn our house upside down to find the lost. <coughs> Have we counted? Have you counted? Do you notice when someone's lost? <coughs> what do you do when you recognize that somebody is And then we have the final parable of the two sons, or the lost son. And we see now there's a motif of three here. We've had this motif before. We grew up reading stories. Remember, the two ugly stepsisters make way for what? The beautiful and dynamic Cinderella. We have the two pigs that don't know how to build a house that make way for the third pig that what? Knows how to build on solid ground. So we know this motif of three really works. We have a sheep and a coin story to set up the parable of the lost.
consumption. So it starts out familiar. There was a man who had two sons. And we know about two sons, don't we? We have Adam who had Cain and Abel. Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael. And then Isaac had twin sons, Esau and Jacob. And the plot line usually of those stories is what? The elder son. The elder son is the one who engages in some stupid and evil action. And then the younger son comes by as the clever one to solve and satisfy everything. The, the younger one is the responsible one and becomes the father's successor. But not in these parables. Who turns out to be the prodigal? The younger son. So that's a change from what the first century listener had read and understand. It's not the older son that is the one that gets in trouble. It's the younger son. And so he spends money, he spends his resources recklessly, he's wastefully extravagant. That's who the younger son is. So it doesn't match up with Abel. It doesn't match up with Jacob. So, And this is the parable's first surprise to the first century listener. Listen, it just doesn't add up. And, and a lot of times we preach today that when the son asked for money, that it's rude. Well, today, if a son came and said, Dad, I wish you were dead. I want half your inheritance. I'm leaving. We would think that's rude. But in the first century, it was very normal for a Jewish father to give his son money, lots of money, maybe even half of his inheritance, and send him on his way. That was not rude. So when they heard that, we hear it as, well, that wasn't very nice. They didn't hear it that way. They heard it as a Jewish father doing for his son. This is normal. He's going out to make his way. This is a good thing. But we would maybe look at the father and say, maybe he's the prodigal. Maybe he's the one wasting money by giving it to his son. But this was not how the first century listeners heard it. But we know what happens, don't we? The son goes out to some extravagant living. And he gets to the point where he's got a great job feeding the pigs. And he's so hungry that the food that the pigs are eating looks really good to him. And, and we can kind of look at pigs in the story. What? That's a, that was an unclean animal. The Jews wouldn't eat that. But this was in a Gentile area, so it wasn't a problem where he was, according to the story that Jesus tells. He's in a Gentile area, so he just needed work. The problem, though, is not the work, is that he's hungry and alone. That's the problem with this story. That's where he is. And so he comes to his senses. He decides to go home. And if we interpret it as repentance and forgiveness, this is the part where that's supposed to take place. That the son is going to repent and ask for forgiveness. But Jesus doesn't say that the son's repenting. It just says he's turning to go home. Because he's hungry and alone. In fact, the Bible says, Jesus said the Son came to Himself. He came to Himself. So maybe the light bulb went on, or in the first century, the oil lamp went on in His head. <coughs> and that oil lamp told Him He needed to go home. But what did He repent of? What sin did He commit? Wasting money is foolish, but is it sinful? Maybe He was going back home to get more money from His Father. We see that in other parts of the Bible where, where people actually talk like an inner monologue of what they're going to do and what they're thinking as they go back. We don't have that here. We don't know what the son's rehearsed words are. And we don't ever get to hear him speak those words because what happened? The father runs to his son when he sees him. And, and he runs to him because what would, we, what would we expect the father to do? I mean, if your son was lost and you didn't know where he was and then you saw him, wouldn't you run to greet him? I think we would. And so there's compassion here. It's the same compassion we're going to see next week in the story of the Good Samaritan. It's that kind of compassion. Someone <coughs> is dead is a lie. Thought, thought was dead is a lie. And if you think the father should be angry, that would have been out of character because there's not a precedent in the Bible that would show the father being angry when the son is found. So it's very normal for him to show compassion. That's what he's doing. Now, the, the action of robe and ring and fatted calf, that stands on its own. But the father is not concerned about the son's repentance. 
just like the sheep owner is not concerned about the repentant sheep, or the woman being concerned about the repentant coin. That's not what is here. The father is rejoicing that the son is home. He's back from the dead. And he adorns him with the finest accessories that the family can have. But the parable is what? About a man and two sons. But all we have here is the one son. And sometimes we stop right there. That that's the parable. He's lost, is found. Oh, joy, party. Send them out. Find the lost. But this one goes a little further than the party. Where's the older brother? Why is he invited to the party? Have we forgotten about the older brother? The parable is about the prodigal son, and that's how we say it, that we've forgotten about the older son. The parable is really about two sons. So we look at the elder son. And what is the elder son doing? He's working. He's doing what he's been doing the whole time. He, the, the baby son was gone. He's working. He's being obedient. He's doing the right thing. And when he hears one of his workers tell him why there's a party, your brother has come home, he rejoices. No. He gets angry. Mad. I've done all the right things, and he gets the party. Have you been there? <laughs> and we may feel sorry for him. We may say, you know, that's just not right. You should give a party to the guy that's always done it right. Not to the guy that squandered the dad's money. But, he's not the conventional angry brother. Remember how Cain, what did Cain do? He murdered Abel. What was Ishmael called? He was called a wild donkey of a man. And Esau threatened to murder Jacob. So this brother is angry and upset, but he doesn't want to kill his brother. At least he doesn't say that. But he was doing what was expected of him, he's being obedient. So the other parables, the sheep owner, the woman, they summon their friends to celebrate the loss. In this case, no one notices that the elder brother is missing. They're having a party. They're having a great time. And the elder brother is out working, being obedient. So the father realizes it. Because what's the father do? He counts. Somebody is missing. I have to go find the lost. And he finds his elder son doing exactly what he knew he was doing. He's out in the field working. So the older son erupts in anger and says how unfair it is to the father. He talks of loyalty and obedience. And my brother gets all these beautiful accessories and I've done all of this for you. In fact, he even doesn't use inclusive language. The father says, son of mine. The elder brother says, son of yours. He doesn't even say my brother. He's outraged. He even says, you're, you're, you're the younger son, are you associated with prostitutes? But Jesus doesn't say that. He said, squandered money with wild living. But the elder brother is going to throw him under the bus with all the worst things he can. You know he's with a bunch of prostitutes. Well, Jesus doesn't say that. But he's imagining, isn't he? And maybe he's imagining what he would have done if he would have taken the money. No, he's just not being kind to his brother. And sometimes we say that, well, that's the representation of the Jews and the Pharisees suggesting that divine love has to be earned. That's called works righteousness. And even Judaism, and of course Christianity, does not believe in works righteousness. Meaning, you cannot do enough work to get yourself into heaven. You cannot do enough work to be recognized by God, you have to say yes to him and let him into your heart. Jews know that. They learned that in the Torah. So maybe this is a story about a family being a family. When the father says son, the Greek word there is technon, T-E-K-N-O-N, and it means beloved child of God. This isn't just son. This is 
beloved, cherished son that I adore and love more than the world, you know that everything that is mine is yours. You're always with me. It's that beautiful compassion that the Father has. And he says more. The Father says, I'm rejoicing because your brother, brother was dead and he was brought back to life. He was lost and now is lost. Is found. And the Father is tender because he's showing the older son how he deeply cares for both of his sons. So that's where if we cast the Father as God and the older son as the Pharisees, it falls apart because the allegory doesn't work there. A brother was missing. A family was not whole. And now the older brother, who the father is searching for through his words, attempts to draw him close. Because now we've got another lost son. Not just the prodigal, but now the elder son is also lost. And the father goes and looks for him because he counts and sees him missing. And he wants him home. And then we have celebration in store for him. Does the older brother go to the party? What will the race relationship be between the two brothers? So this parable is about the challenge that we have as families. The parable shows indulgence does not buy love. Remember this. The parable shows indulgence does not buy love, but withholding it can stifle it. So we search desperately when our families are not whole, while sheep and coins may be easy to find, children are more difficult to find. This is the genius of Jesus' teaching. <clears throat> so we can't use allegory to make it fun and nice and 21st century. We're going to read the parables as they were written and as first century people heard them and interpreted them to understand them because it's genius. It's just not a Bible story. I know I'm a preacher. I know I love this stuff. I know I'm supposed to. I get that. But I want you to love it too. Because it's genius. It's amazing. And time will tell in the family what you do with the money he's won. Will you make him pay it back? Are you going to make the son repent? Are you going to ask him to get on his knees and forgive? Is that what the father's going to do? What's the message when we have somebody that is lost? What are we going to do? What if the lost one is right in our own house? Like the old brother. Think of messages we're supposed to do what it takes to find him and celebrate his return. Don't wait for apologies or the ability to forgive. They may never come. But look for reconciliation. And further than that, there's a family here that extends out into the world. It's not just your blood family, but there's family here now because we're a community of faith. And so what family members have we lost that we need to reach out to, to reconcile with? When we look around, we know that there's lost. When we count, we know there are families that are missing in our community of faith. But we know that searching for sheep and searching for coins... Hard, hard work. But in searching, there's also finding and the potential to bring ourselves back to wholeness. Do you know the laws? Do they count? Do you make sure everyone feels counted? The message for us here today is that when Jesus Christ teaches us to welcome our neighbors and our enemies and the lost, that even those that are lost and alienated are to be welcomed and celebrated as we just demonstrate the compassion of Jesus Christ to all of them. Let's keep our lost and found department open. Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and of the two sons. We thank you that you can teach us how to count and find the lost and search for them, and welcome them, and celebrate them when they are found. It's not important that there's forgiveness, but what's important is reconciliation. It's not important where somebody gets on their knees and begs. It's important that you reach out with the kind of technon love and compassion for a beloved 
person that is lost. So Almighty God, we ask that you would help us to count and then to search diligently for those that are lost, whether in our family or in our community of faith family. Amen. Final hymn of the Bible.